So this webinar was based on, you know, just an overview of our system. We released some blogs uh, recently, PS0101. They're on our, available on our website. Four-part series that talk about, you know, poor trips, why we need them, um, and the different applications of eliminating these poor trips. And then expansion joints and blog four, which is actually still going to come out, um, is about installation. So and we'll talk about that um, lay towards the end of the presentation. So without that, I'm going to share with all that, share my screen. Thank you for coming today. Um, I really appreciate it. And we appreciate it. Uh, my brother, my dad and I, and my whole uh, company. Um, the system's really taken off. And it's because of folks like you who are willing to think outside the box about horse trips. So Jared Rakestead, yes, uh, VP, um, owner. Um, and, uh, you know, you have me here. So I can't wait to add, answer questions at the end of this. Um, we're going to get into this. So part one is limiting poor trips. I grabbed this picture recently, Father's Day, uh, with my dad, Gord, in the middle. He's the inventor of the system. So it's kind of uh, uh, fun to see him and my brother Jason on the right, and I'm on the left. So we were celebrating Father's Day a couple weeks ago. And happy Father's Day to those of you who are fathers. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been a super fun uh, time here, last five, 10 years, developing this system together with my dad and brother. And uh, now actually implementing it and seeing it go from our basement um, into these buildings and saving months on project schedules. And it's super fun. So, but yeah, we eliminate poor strips, wall leave outs and expansion joints. Um, so these are different parts. And then the last part, as I mentioned, is, is part four, the installation uh, portion. So PS0 is a mechanical reinforcement splice. That's all it really is. It's very simple. Um, one end is threaded on the left-hand side and the other end is uh, uh, grouted on the right-hand side. So a thread over here and a grout-filled sleeve and this bar goes in and gets grouted later. So it's really that simple. Um, I'm going to actually play the quick video right now so you can Get a background if you haven't seen it, um, but you'll it'll give you an idea of the system in our slab to slab application. Sorry, one second. I just notified that there's no sound right now. So let me just change that. And I'm going to start the video from where it is. But you guys will get the... Mechanically couples rebar while allowing for movement caused by shrinkage and post-tensioning compression forces in the slab. Traditional pore strips require leave-out spaces and significant form work. No leave-outs are needed with PS0. Let's take a look at the installation process. It starts with torquing a threaded rebar into the coupler. Next, a form placer is installed to the bulkhead and the coupler is placed onto the form placer and fastened to the bulkhead. Grout tubes are installed into the top of the coupler. These tubes create ports for grouting. Concrete is poured and the grout tubes are cut off. Caps are installed so no debris gets into the coupler before grouting. Before the second pour, a bond breaker is sprayed onto the first pour. Then the continuation rebar is inserted into the coupler. The adjacent slab is poured directly up to the first pour. During the specified amount of time, the joint opens up as the concrete shrinks without the need for traditional pour strip formwork. The couplers and joint are grouted, creating structural rebar continuity without significant reforming of the pour strip. PS0 saves time and money without redesign, maintains structural rebar continuity, provides for safer construction, is ICC approved, and is made in the USA. PS0, the poor strip alternative, developed by structural engineers. All right. Um, 
So that's the gist of it. Pretty simple solution, and we're getting in, getting in into uh, some of the reasons why we we need this system. So, um, let me see here. So, why we need pour strips? So, and what they are? So, it's a temporary leave out between two concrete pours in a slab. Essentially, um, they allow for uh, volume change. And contrary to what people think, they're not there for stressing purposes only. Okay. They're really there because of the shrinkage issues and the restraint problems we have with connecting slabs to vertical elements, all right? People think we need them for stressing. Yes, you do need a place to stress with PT, um, but often you're able to, if it's only for stressing, you can fill those in right away. These are delay strips that are left out for 28, 56, even longer, 90 days, and they're poured back later, okay? But they are using PT and reinforced concrete. Um, when you pour them back, uh, they're just a lap splice uh, in rebar. That's it. Um, and they provide continuity uh, of the rebar. They uh, load, transfer all the loads that the engineer um, needs them to transfer. Um, so, but they're all, they're on the critical path. And you can see in this picture how, you know, this is time consuming and delays other trades. And actually it's the most expensive concrete that does get poured on a job. So this is an example of what a pour strip looks like in a slab condition with PT in this one on both sides there. In a wall. So we often, you know, if we're below grade, we have this. Uh, we need a place to stress and engineers will specify leave outs at uh, walls and they stress from them. Walls have a tremendous amount, tremendous amount of restraint. So often there's a leave out uh, detail or there's some kind of slip detail at walls because we don't want to connect our slabs too early to walls. Um, why though? We need them because of, of the volume change issues with concrete, okay? If we had a concrete slab that was floating in space, wasn't attached to anything, we wouldn't need pore strips. It could just shrink to its center of mass and not be restrained by anything, okay? Uh, in PT, we have other pieces, elastic shortening and creep shortening. PT forces only account for 20% of the shrinkage, all right? Contrary, another myth about PT is that, you know, there's a lot of additional movement because of uh, the PT forces and the compression in the slab. Not necessarily the case. It's about 20%. Okay. Restraint is the problem, and that's the RTS. Engineers, engineers will refer to that. This is the, the, the key graph, though, why engineers use certain um, days and times for leave out. So at 28 days, which is typically a minimum in the industry, uh, my company has used 28 days for a long time, um, you get 40% of your volume change out. And at 120, you can see this, you know, 70% out. And even longer, um, you get better slab performance, okay? And we're talking about restraint cracks. And the problem with restraint cracks, um, the problem is that the restraint crack typically goes straight through the slab. When, this, when it goes straight through the slab and it's not a surface crack, it can cause life safety issues uh, with the floors and, and the slabs themselves, okay? So not dealing with restraint, um, can have a, a you know a big effect on the structure, and the longer we leave our you know the leave out or say our couplers ungrouted or the joint ungrouted with PS zero, the better slab performance we get. The problem is with a typical leave out, the longer you leave it, the more expensive construction is as well. So easy to see. And here you go. This building is broken into three pieces, all uh, individually um, by these two pore strips. So you see that um, restraint uh, is, you know, basically big time on these walls. Everything wants to shrink to the center of mass, which is these green, uh, these green circles. When anything is connecting to the slab that's going to resist that, it's going to cause restraint cracking, especially walls um, that are shear walls or tied in. If you get your uh, center of mass close to your uh, center of stiffness, like these cores here, that's where you want to be. It's it's these problem uh, areas on the perimeter that are, are really going to cause the issues. So we can't talk, uh, you know, about trips without shoring and backshoring discussions. And I'm not sure if everybody knows this. These terms get thrown around in the industry often, and I don't think people know what each other are talking about half the time. But a reshore is when you just have a typical slab, you pour it, you pull your formwork, you have reshores. The reshores are there to support the wet concrete above, typically two to four levels down. And when you don't need the reshores anymore, you pull your reshores as you go up the building. A backshore is when you can't pull your formwork and can't release the slab. So the load 
will always uh, be there until you know it can support itself. In a pour strip situation, you need to pour it back and have the concrete strength there. Until it's poured back, you're typically in a backshoring situation, and that is very problematic for construction in general, uh, the whole project. So this is what this kind of looks like uh, in a little graphic. On the left-hand side, um, you see like a, a reshore situation. In this case, the you know this top level is you know um, getting poured, and then uh, these bottom three are the reshores. On the right, you have a backshoring situation where it, you have uh, a higher demand at the lower levels, and, and that is shown by red, where the load builds up down the building. That's shown a little bit better here. So this is a job we worked on in Boston, and this is a bay right here. We came in halfway through the building. So on the left, that's the backshoring portrait bay. And this is what it looks like. Um, some engineers put this on their plans to kind of show contractors like, hey, you got a backshoring situation. You know, you need to deal with this. All right. Let's see here. Um, location. We see different locations of pore strips. I'm just going to briefly touch on these. So this is what PTI says about it. You know, it basically says, you know, the preferred location is mid-span. But we don't, they don't want to say anything about why that is. But for longer spans, the best approach is to the quarter point. Or the inflection point is what they're talking about. So, But they don't really tell us tell us uh, why either. The last sentence is key in this uh, uh, situation. This last sentence tells the story um, that backshoring and reshoring and things like that are definitely an issue that need to be considered. And if you don't do that, you're going to have problems with, with the structures. So on an inflection point you know, or a quarter point towards one of the columns, engineers like this spot because the bending moment's low, OK? Um, the bending moment's low, the shear's high, and you can basically uh, design the PT, you know, without doing anything. PT wants to be mid to the slab right here, and that's where it's at. Um, the problem is with this is you're always going to force backshoring of this bay. It's always going to be backshore because this long cantilever can't self-support. The short cantilever can, but the other issue with this is this load back here, if you don't backshore that bay, this cantilever will pop up and you'll have a vertical movement right here at this slab. And I'm sure the contractors on, you probably grind, you have grinded down uh, slabs that have done this. Um, so that's the issues with that. But, oh, and this is what that looks like. And I didn't even show the back over here being, um, being, you know, back short. So it really is uh, this a single bay, and and the problem with backshoring is it's not just you know after you fill in the pore strip, okay? You fill in the lower levels, and you think you, you're good to go. Not the case. You need to fill top down because you have to release from the top down. You can't start pulling your backshores until you can self support above, and this is the killer. So at a mid span, uh, not self supporting. This, in my opinion, is is not the best situation at all because your PT is less effective. Uh, mid span, and you get the you get the back shore of this whole bay, okay. But a lot of engineers put the port strips uh, at this location as well. Um, but it will always force back shoring a mid span back shoring situation, just like you have here on the right. Okay. Some engineers, this is less common across the country, and in, you know where I've learned a lot from other engineers is a self supporting center uh, uh, port strip between columns. So you can add PT to make this uh, these cantilevers self supporting. You get rid of the backshoring, you still have all the formwork left in place and you still have the reshores that you have to stay here um, until the, the, the pore strip is poured, okay? But you're in a situation like this, not as bad as backshoring, but still not good. So on the left, you have a situation where you're backshoring, on the right, you don't. PS0 gives you the, uh, a situation that you see on the right, that you, know, you basically have self-supporting slabs and you have no backshoring, all right? And that's the key to the system. And here's how it works. So have the, re, the, re, the coupler in the, in the short span, typically, the joint here, um, and you have a threaded bar on the, on the one end of the coupler and a loose bar that gets put in before the second pour, and that's this middle bar. That loose bar um, pulls out slightly um, when these two slabs separate, okay? 
And then after the specified amount of time, you fill the coupler. Uh, it's an inlet and an outlet. It's a gravity feed, pretty simple. And then you fill the joint and then you're good to go. While it's ungrouted, B-bar here uh, coming into the coupler is supported by the coupler and the coupler is supported by the slab. So that's the load transfer. Long span, um, in this case, inflection point, is supported by the short span through the dowel action of the rebar and the coupler in that short span. Uh, pretty simple C calculations that we use through ACI to, to you know, figure out what the load capacities uh, are for this condition. We're going to get into um, the different uh, uh, conditions we do solve. For, uh, we have a slab to slab. Temporary, we have a temporary side to side with a temporary stressing uh, strip. We have walls that we solve uh, pore strip issues with and sequencing and expansion joint. So slab to slab, typical pore strip looks like this. What we do is we like to go at the inflection point. Our system is less expensive. Your PT is less expensive and your rebar. It's the most dialed in location uh, that you can have now for a pore strip or a PSE relief joint because everything is dialed in. Uh, the demand here for our system is mostly shear. We're at mid-depth of the slab, and um, we have a spacing and a typical, like, say, eight-inch slab at, like, one foot six on center. Um, so slab to slab, the purple or the blue gets poured first, and you can stress it from either side of that slab. The bond breaker goes on, the yellow, and then the red gets placed. You have to stress the red from the opposite side. So if you don't have access to that, um, you're going to need a different solution that allows for some stressing from a strip. We use that um, detail, this detail, below grade quite often um, where stressing is a problem. So you can pour the blue, stress it, pour the red, stress from the temporary strip, and then place the bond breaker on between the yellow and the blue right at the upper, uh, slab edge. The system works exactly like it, it, it would without this temporary stressing strip. So you can pull your formwork and just reshore in this condition. And the only thing going through the joint, remember, is our dowel bar, this a continuation bar that we, we call. Wall. So like I said before, engineers will uh, often specify wall leave outs because walls are so stiff. If there's one thing that causes the most restraint in our buildings, it's walls. Steer walls, basement walls. And the kill killer is, is that the closer we get to the bottom of a building, the more restraint there is. So subterranean uh, walls are the worst, the very worst for our, our uh, restraint problems with slabs. So this is what walls do, right? Like, so you, we have a detail upper right. It's just our slotted, our coupler allows for movement in two directions. So transverse to the coupler, like left to right and in and out. So you place this in the wall and it releases uh, the slab from the wall and allows the slab to move independently of the wall until we grow the joint and the coupler back. The, the detail down below has a temporary leave out. If you need to stress below grade, and we're changing. A lot of engineers I've found out across the country use reinforced concrete below grade and then they shift to PT above grade. Why do they do that? Reinforced concrete is more expensive than PT. Everybody knows that. Um, they do it because of stressing issues. Okay, but now with a system like ours, you can have a temporary leave out to stress below grade and fill it in, and you can still get the performance you do. Uh, it's releasing the slab or having a wall leave out. Okay, um, and that's what this is. So the red gets poured first. Often the walls are poured first. Okay, uh, going up a building, they might want to get two, three levels of the wall up and then connect the slab slabs later. So. There's like a dowel bar coming out or a form saver. And then our coupler just gets placed onto that bar. Um, and then after the PT is stressed, and you can fill this yellow in uh, right away. The bond breaker goes on the wall now um, and between the wall and the slab. And then the section on the right, yellow and red, move away right and allow it to move in and out of the page to release the restraint. Pretty slick. We're doing a lot of walls right now. Um, sequencing. This is pretty simple, very much like our walls, but you might have a high rise building and you're hooking up a lower, um, lower rise next to it. And you want to connect these structures together. Expansion joints. This is something very cool that wasn't even on our radar at all. But these details come from, from engineers who are using our system to eliminate expansion joints. Expansion joints are needed primarily because of 
temperature changes during construction. Okay, so if you have an enclosed building, not a parking garage, a parking garage will always need expansion joint if it's required. An enclosed building, once it's enclosed and under temperature regulation, the building doesn't know the temperature, right? Like it knows the temperature is fine, doesn't need the expansion joint. So um, you can use our system to basically get rid of double columns, double beams, double structure, um, all the expense of an expansion joint. Here's another detail. Um, and take note of right here, this note, okay, on the right-hand side. The engineer, smart, you know it's an expansion joint when they're saying after the building is enclosed, and we're working on a job right now that the requirement is a pore strip, and it's a, it's a hospital in Indianapolis, and uh, the requirement for the pore strip is 120 days, plus the engineer, MKA, uh, my friends out of the Seattle office, are using that to also say, wait till the building is enclosed and under regulated temperature. So 120 days plus have the building enclosed under regulated temperature, okay? That's amazing. And without a system like PS0, that would have delayed this project months, okay? Months in these areas for finishing. They're gonna turn that thing over much sooner now. Beams, PT and reinforced concrete beams. Um, you know, we, we do them all, uh, we're doing a lot of jobs right now that have both, uh, PT beams and reinforced concrete beams in them. And the system works very good. We just have longer grout tubes, as you can see in the details on the right, to grout those beams, um, that are, that, that are down below. Oh, sorry, that are at the bottom of the beam. So when we run into congestion issues, this is a general statement. Um, we try to do as best we can to work with the engineers to dial in our system so we're only coupling the loads required. So when you get a set of drawings and our system is not in there, but you want to use it, we're not going to couple every single bar at the pore strip or every single bar at the beam. We work with the engineer to figure out what the load is. Um, and, you know, we do that for a few reasons because we only need to transfer certain forces at certain places along the, the beam or the slab. And in this case, uh, we did still run into some congestion issues. And when we do, we put couplers on both sides of the joint. On one side, uh, the coupler goes in the first pour. And the second side, the coupler goes in the second pour. If it's the second pour, there's a piece of rebar sticking out of the first pour that receives our coupler. Very similar, uh, just like in wall conditions. Installation, we're gonna get into this. Um, so torquing the bar on, pretty simple. We provide a torque wrench. Um, the the easiest way to put our system in is to put it in first, or if you have a bottom mat, put the bottom mat in, put our system in next, and then if it's PT, put the PT in next, because you can shift PT around. On the left, we have a stressing strip, where this is going to be left out for stressing down below grade in a parking garage, and that's why these are green, uh, epoxy coated. On the right, we just have a typical mid-depth condition here in a slab. Form work is the same, all right? On the left, it shows you, that's a pore strip, a PS0 joint above here. And, and the form work is no different. So you get to have form work, boom, 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 all the same, cycle that through. On the right is a job where we came in on the level above the one you see with the pore strip below to save them, uh, you know, on the schedule. The form work is the same. You, every, every day on the, uh, every, as, as in every day on the job. So um, second pore installation here. Basically, you have a slab edge. On the left, this was a mid-span condition. And so we had couplers at the bottom, and then we spaced the couplers a little further out on the right and allowed for, um, you know, stressing through this little stressing, uh, temporary stressing strip in the middle here. Before the second pour, bond breaker gets put on. On the right, you see our bars going in here. That's what you're seeing next to the PP, okay? And we easily go in adjacent to PT, um, and attendants, uh, things like that. We usually just space right in between those, no problem. Here goes the concrete. Bond breaker was put on, just finishing the concrete, slab the slab in these conditions. You can run your machines right over the slab. Um, it's a bit older application with some of the grout tubes sticking up. Usually today we have our grout tubes down at slab height and you finish right over top. Um, unless we have beams, sometimes contractors prefer to leave those grout tubes higher. Here's what joints look like, okay? We typically see movements in the quarter inch to a half inch range. Um, it varies, there's a lot of variables uh, to consider uh, when it comes to that. So everybody, everybody always asks me like, how much do these joints open up? And it, it really depends on, on the 
system, the concrete, when things were poured, things like that. But I would say good rule of thumb, we see stuff quarter to a half inch. Grouting. We give you tools to grout, a mixing tool, a slump tool you see on the right. And once you get the consistency right, it's really just pouring in a funnel. And this is the preferred version of grouting our couplers. A lot of folks just like a little funnel with a pinch off piece. And one person is mixing, the other two um, are grouting. One's just pouring the grout in the funnel. The other one is, you know, pinching it off. And when the grout gets, uh, when the couple gets full, they move on to the next one. On the left is a joint. On the right, we have these uh, tubes sticking up. It was a reinforced concrete beam here. So this is what I was saying earlier about, you know, the grout tubes coming up. These can all be cut flush, but they preferred to leave them run, run a little high here. This is what things uh, look like. Uh, and you can see why this is such a time saving device because we get to put all these mechanicals and all these other trades get to work across these joints before they're even grouting. This, all this mechanical and equipment you see right here would have to wait, be delayed if our system wasn't used. Above joints right here, showing joints from above. And this is a wood frame building. So podiums, we do a lot of podiums where they start the wood framing over our joint prior to, you know, the they don't have to leave it out like in with a normal pour strip we have number sixes sevens and eights currently and we're doing more testing um for nines tens and we'll probably get you up the number 11 bars uh within a year or two uh especially for cord steel and reinforcement on the in the seismic areas that we do a lot of work in um chemical coupler we give you guys everything grout tubes cap all the accessories everything essentially accept the rebar, which we will provide. We're starting to uh, thread our own bar. So we're gonna start providing that in our package. Um, we provide it now at additional cost and it will be an additional cost, but we're gonna start just giving a whole package with the threaded bar, continuation bar and our system to you guys. So here's a project. We're just gonna talk quickly about this where our system came in, um, seventh floor of 12. Uh, they were looking at two months, Two month delay, a million dollars liquidated damage. Suffolk was in Boston. We came in, seek the pore strip location with the EOR, McNamara Salva out of Boston. Um, there's a little slope in the pore strip, all them shifted. We want to follow that inflection point to make everything self supporting. This is what it looked like. You can band attendance here. Um, we have the couplers going right in the slab. Pretty simple. This is how things are looking with these red uh, grout tube caps, and they finished right over top. Here's uh, this little slope section. If you got a slope, you got to build like a little standoff tool uh, or piece that goes into uh, the form, the bulkhead. And but simple, not that uh, big a deal. We get good uh, performance out of these sloping uh, joints versus 90 degree bends or turns, sorry, and uh, with cracking, crack control. So pretty simple. They put the bottom mat in, the continuation bar went in, and then they're going to put that top mat in and, and put the bond breaker on and, and pour this second pour. Pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, this is what the joint looks like. And these pictures here, I tell people what you don't see. The coupler's not grouted. The joint's not grouted. There's no back shoring in place. Okay. The concrete contractor got off this job like five weeks early. They did have to come back and grow out our couplers, but they were gone. They got all their form work out of there. They're de they demobed pretty much. It's minimal work coming back to do the joint grouting and, and the coupler grouting. But this is what saves the time and the money. I mean, not only is there benefit just for the concrete, but the huge benefit for the owners, the schedule, the general contractor, the safety. We get people just requesting our system from the top down, owners, developers, um, and VCs that ask their concrete contractors to use it because they just, they know the benefits, okay? And this is that backshoring situation on the left. Here's that bay, backshore, first few levels. On the right, that same bay. Now they uh, haven't even grown our couples above here. No backshoring, nothing left in place. Um, we're getting a little close on uh, the time here. This is a cool project we're working on right now in Charlotte. See our national sales managers out there. We did a number of things. We released the wall from the detail on the left. We changed that. Our detail on the right. Um, we changed their, they had a dressing strip they needed. So we used the detail on the right and put our system in. Pretty cool job because they used a bunch of our applications. They're using a bunch of our applications right now. And then the top of wall condition, we, we changed that as well, using our coupler. 
And then this on the elevated structures, we went slab to slab. We replaced the detail on the left with the detail on the right. Um, so super slick uh, system. The benefits are enormous. You know, I mean, if you if you if you understand concrete construction and pour strips, it's not hard to see what the benefits really are. It just depends who you are. You know, the formwork, shoring, the concrete sub. You know, who's the benefit to, and who's the who does it benefit most? It benefits everybody, um, but the biggest benefit really is to the general contractor, the owner. Schedule is huge uh, with the system. So I think I want to thank everybody. You know, this was a half an hour, kind of a quick hitter. Um, first one that I've done, and I know I talked very fast. Um, so I hope people stick around for some questions. I'll look in the Q&A, and if you raise your hand, I'll answer some questions. And we're going to start doing these more often, so look for these. They're going to have different subjects. Uh, you know, every month we're going to try to do a little webinar that with me and and um, and some of our other staff to, you know, talk about the system and tell you, you know, what we've been doing, what we got going on, because um, it's really taken the industry by storm from coast to coast. And we have jobs going in Canada now. There's a lot of interest internationally as well. So appreciate you jumping on. I am going to click on the Q&A and, and open up the participants so I can raise a hand. Um, and and see if you want to ask some questions if there are questions i see some stuff happening in the chat right here i'm going to read uh these out loud okay um how is the loose rebar able to achieve full tension capacity and shut such a short distance within the grouted coupler is it because the coupler provides confinement and prevents concrete breakout uh kyle Great question. I get this a lot. I get it a lot from folks who have never seen um, or used, been familiar with grouted rebar couplers. So grouted rebar uh, couplers have been around actually longer than threaded uh, couplers. So the same question can be asked is like, how can you develop the full bar in, in just a short thread? It's really the same question. Um, so it is a combination of the, you know, the grout filled sleeve. It's a combination of how big the sleeve is, the, gr the grooves and the ridges inside there, um, the bar size and the grout itself. We use a very high strength grout. It gets to, it gets, well, I think uh, full uh, concrete uh, strength is around 12,000. It gets to about 8,000 in about five to seven days. So once that is locked in um, and grouted, the bar has full development uh, capacity. So type one and type two. So type one is 125% of FY. That's your yield strength of the bar, okay? So these are defined by ACI and they're in the testing criteria of, of our ICC um, approval for coupler. These are all common with all couplers, threaded, grouted, doesn't matter. Um, so uh, the type two requirement, that's used for mostly in seismic uh, engineers who require that. And that is 100% uh, of the ultimate strength of the bar. So you develop the whole strength of the bar, the ultimate strength of it. So what they're trying to do with, with those uh, that criteria is they're trying to yield the bar so we don't have brittle failure. And that's why we have these requirements for type one and type two. That's a, that's a great question. Um, let's see if there's anybody raising hands, if someone can, um, raise a hand, I can let people talk and ask some questions. Otherwise, if people are on, I can just describe a few things that we're doing right now with some jobs. Um, that's pretty cool. I mean, we're working with a lot of the, the well-known engineers across the country uh, that people read about, like I had mentioned MKA earlier, Thornton Tomasetti. Of course, we're, we're working with uh, a lot of other smaller engineers, like my firm is a pretty small firm, um, but, uh, but it's, it sometimes has a lot of credibility when you know some of these more well-known people are using the system and well-known contractors. So from generals like Mortensen and McCarthy, Brassfield Gorey, um, Alfred Beatty, to you know, concrete contractors are pretty well known, like Seco, um, Baker's looking Lithco, um, you know, who else? United Forming is, is a big customer of ours, especially you know in Texas. Um, 
And, uh, you know, in the, the Carolinas um, area. So it's pretty, it's been pretty fun. And uh, in Canada, uh, we have some big players up there. PCL, well, PCL uh, Canada, PCL in the U.S. is using our system. And some of the really well-known engineers up in Canada are using it, uh, using it too. So um, feel free to, to, to type some stuff in the, you know, the questions in the chat or, um, I think if you have a spot, you're able to raise your hand, I can unmute you and we could answer, you know, construction questions or, you know, engineering questions. Um, but, uh, yeah. Or if I don't see anything, I might just, um, keep talking, uh, you know, but feel free to drop off uh, if, you, if you, if you need to, if you want to, um, I might uh, go back and look at my presentation a little bit here and just talk about a few things. So what other questions do we often get? We, we get questions like uh, during construction, you know, uh, can we use these bays with your system. And, and what we do in the design, um, we design or sometimes the engineer will, will work with them and they'll design it, but there's a temporary condition and then there is a you know final permanent condition. One is the un, the temporary condition is an ungrouted coupler and that we calculate um, the capacity based on the weight of that longer span, the weight of the concrete, and then uh, the ungrouted coupler. So it's a, just a sheer dowel system, okay? You guys, uh, some of you may have heard of the lockable dowel before. We de we designed our system, um, you you know, after we were proposed the lockable dowel on a project. So our system and the lockable dowel are very similar in this regard that we both use dowel action to temporarily support the slabs. When our system is grouted, um, we get to use shear friction because the rebar now is continuous and it's just like rebar and concrete, there's sheer friction working across the joint with the rebar. The, the lockable dowel does not get to use that. They always are in a hinge condition in like a break in the slab. And that's why a lot of engineers will not touch the lockable dowel. They don't provide continuity. Our system provides rebar continuity. Um, so we designed that uh, temporary condition to, you know, at a minimum of 50 PSF live load, um, like ACI requires for formwork. But that allows the contractor to, for the most part, use the slab as every other slab on the job. If some contractors are looking to run heavier equipment or use it for just bigger, have the bigger demands, then we could adjust those loads um, for that. But at a minimum, it's just typical live load construction loads as your other bays. So you can fully use that bay as you normally would. So, and then when it's locked in, it's it's locked in like any other you know, any other slab or any, it's just like pouring back a pour strip, essentially. So it's just that simple. Um, yeah, some pictures here. We're actually chamfering our joints on top now. We've, we've learned a number of uh, things that we're implementing. Um, the chamfer allows us to pour the grout in easier into the joint, kind of creates a little funnel, if you will, uh, in so we get grout into that joint. Um, especially a lot more effective when we have really small joints. But like I said, you know, usually it's quarter inch, um, maybe up to a half. I haven't really seen much more than that. Five A's, it's, and it depends. We had a job in Minneapolis uh, a couple of years ago, the contractors, you know, sent me a text with a photo that the joint had opened up from like um, a quarter inch to three quarter, but the temperature had dropped from like, you know, 30 above to 30 below. So, I talk to engineers a lot about this, and this has to do with uh, expansion joints, but the, the temperature really affects our structures. Steel, concrete, doesn't matter. Um, a week later, that temperature climbed back up into the above 30, and the joint went right back to like quarter inch. So uh, temperature uh, issues are, are a big, can be a big deal um, when it comes to, you know, our structures that are exposed to the elements. Um, yeah. What other questions here? We 
I know this is not our typical application, but I know there's some some guys on from uh, Arkansas working on a water treatment facility that is um, has a wall leave out uh, in in this water treatment facility. It's a wall leave out. We're doing walls too. Sometimes engineers will specify walls. We have another job in Texas that a wall leave out is specified uh, in. So, um, and we do use our couplers and walls. So we put the coupler in the wall. We rotate them slightly so that the grout tubes can be, you know, out the side at like an angle and we, and we grout it that way. So engineers will often specify, like I said, you know, you can release slabs, but if you, if the engineer has a requirement where they really want to release the wall as well, we can, um, you know, wall and it's, it's a pretty neat application um, for that. Well, I might stay on for a couple more minutes here. Um, but if still, if there's questions, type them in the chat. Um, is anybody raising their hand? I don't know what that looks like. I don't know. Yeah. So let me see. Talk one more thing, a high point here. Um, you know, I did I did talk a bit about backshoring and reshoring, and and it's a huge deal. And I can't I can't overstate that really, especially when I talk to engineers, because a lot of engineers don't understand the the issues with um, with backshoring and reshoring and what that even means. And they often design their pore strips, and they just say, you know, Mr. Contractor uh, or Mrs. Contractor, like you know, figure it out. And the problem is the way they design their poor trips, they're involved in this conversation. And some of them don't think they are. It's like, you know, you're forcing the contractor's hand um, to do something, right? It's not just a means and methods issue, these poor trips. And that's what creates a lot of tension between engineers and contractors. Um, there can be a lot of tension anyway in, in the construction world between engineers and contractors, but the poor strip is always an item that's a contentious issue. And it's the first thing the contractor asks about. They're going to say, you know, to the engineer, do we need the poor strip? Okay, we do. Um, why? They may not know why, or they, the engineer is like, well, because of the length of a building and this and that. But it's not necessarily the length of the building. It has to really do with restraint, okay? Um, but yeah, PT typically post tension structures, when you get above 120 to 130 feet, it needs to be pulled again because of the losses. So you have to have like a double pull. Um, so that's kind of a, a range people use for a pore strip, but it's really about restraint um, and building geometry. Ooh, I had a question pop in. Ooh. You said made in the U.S. Can you provide AIS, AIS clear certification? I guess I'm not familiar with what AIS is. Is that a U.S. Des designation? Um, Bob, do you mind retyping or I can, you know, uh, give you access to speak and you could ask me about that? Let's see. Okay, I unmuted you Bob, if you want to ask me. Um, I have to unmute. I don't know if you want to, but I'm not sure what an AIS certification is. But if something is made in the US, I maybe, I mean, I'm assuming we can um, definitely provide that. We just on a job in Seattle, we provided um, some us all of our credentials for being made and fabricated in the us and they had some project requirements they say it was a public it's a public project uh just north of seattle um so yeah we're doing work in seismic areas high seismic um southern california northern california the bay area we have jobs going in there with like uh conco um who mortensen mccarthy and one of them yeah, Yoakum, we're, we're, Largo is starting to, you know, um, gravitate towards our system. So what else? We, uh, yeah, it means domestic. Okay. Um, 
requires compulsion. Oh yeah, we can provide that certification. So it's really a requirement for uh, American Iron and Steel Act. Okay, thank you, Greg. It requires steel components be made in the U.S. Yes, we can totally provide um, certification that our our system was made and fabricated in the U.S. So if that's important on a job or with an owner, uh, we can certainly um, provide that. Yeah, good question. All right, well, it's about 10 minutes to 1 p.m. Central. Um, I'll give one more chance if someone wants to write something in the chat or, um, you know, raise their hand, um, we can do that. Or otherwise, I'm gonna probably just sign off and, and um, we're gonna make this uh, webinar available, um, the recording, so. You might see an email, you have access to the recording. We might, we're probably gonna put it on our YouTube station as well. So um, again, I thank you all for coming today uh, for your time. I know it's valuable. It's the week before the 4th of July, if you're in the US um, and celebrate that. So um, hopefully you have a nice, safe and happy 4th of July holiday. Um, and yeah, we just really appreciate you. We appreciate you uh, with your interest and your use of the system. Um, and I got another question here. Oh yeah.